in this passage. He's been complaining bitterly that God wasn't doing anything about the spiritual state of the land. He's now way on the opposite extreme. Stunned by what God is on the very verge of doing, rattled by the people who will be doing this. And Habakkuk is feeling like he's been clobbered. Habakkuk is reeling. Habakkuk is utterly confused. As his expectations of God, previously scandalised, frustrated by these expectations not being met through God's apparent inactivity. God wasn't inactive, but he seemed to be. He's once again got his expectations of God shattered by the extent, by the nature, by the intensiveness of what God's going to do. So here's the question, what do you do then? When the foundations are rattled and you are shaken. When you're utterly rattled by what God has done or is doing. What are you going to do? You're going to trust him? Or you're not. Because that's the, that's the dividing line. That's where faith happens or doesn't happen. The faith of it. And God has dismayed or shaken or, or surprised Habakkuk so much. Habakkuk, he just resorts to going back to what God is like. There are sometimes in life, there are occasions, there are situations, there are circumstances. You do not understand what is going on. You just do not get it. You do not know. Your human brain cannot comprehend what on earth is going on here. Where did you go? Habakkuk teaches us straight away. He goes back to the character of God. But what do we know about it? We don't understand this. We don't get this. This is a what situation. And what do you do with it? You go back to the character of God. What's he like? What do I know about it? That's what we do. Faith resorts to the character of God. There's tons I don't understand. There's tons I don't like. But what's he like? Now the natural challenge posed to faith by the apparent triumph of the forces of godlessness, it has an effect on you. It has an effect on the faithful. But it has the effect of suggesting that God is no longer at his post. Let's put it like that. God, where are you in it? What, what, where, where are you? Habakkuk's first reminded to himself of the character of God, verse 12a, is this. God is not dead. Here's what it says. Lord, are you not for everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. So in two dimensions. In time past, you're everlasting. You're way back, in, eternal in the, in the past. But, but Lord, you're never going to die. You return on to the future as well. So he's standing at this point looking back and looking forwards. God is not dead. Now this is a real important thing to get hold of. Given the way God does not usually take us into his counsel as if he needs us, he needs us to give him our advice, you know. He doesn't usually do that. The cause for the trust of his people when we don't know what's going on, it's easy sometimes to think he's given up on the job. Isn't it? Do you remember Elijah and the prophets of Baal? Now they were dead gods. And Elijah's standing on the mountain with you know, the altars up there and whatever, the, the offering's ready on the altar. And uh, the prophets of Baal are there all day, cutting themselves and slashing themselves the way they did in their religion and jumping around and trying to get fire to come from heaven and set fire to the, to the, to the, to the uh, wood around the altar. And Elijah stands there and he talks to them and he says, Shout louder, perhaps he's deaf, you know, perhaps he's on a journey, perhaps he's, you know, where is your God? He's not, he's not listening. Perhaps, shout louder, he's got a bit, you know, hard of hearing in his old age. Like, he must have been a really interesting preacher to listen to, you know, Elijah, because he, he really went for it, you know? And then, of course, he says, Lord God, let, let people know, let them see that today that there is a God in Israel, and that I'm your prophet, and fire comes from heaven and sets fire. Now, it looked as if Elijah did not have a leg upon which to stand. One man alone on a mountain top, and he just drenched the altar and the kindling with water. Buckets and buckets of water. And God steps in. Habakkuk has to go back to this, that, that God hasn't given up on the job. He's not asleep, he's not on holiday, he's not dead. But in his distress at the impact of the things that have been told him in, in the immediately preceding verses, given what he sees, it's no wonder, isn't it, that Habakkuk's thoughts are running on when he's not dead. And he's saying, no, you're not dead. You haven't been, you've always been there, and you're not going to be, you will never die. And these Babylonians are coming, and they're going to overrun the nation, and they're bound to give some verbal abuse to the abilities, to the existence 
of Israel's God. He's saying, you're not, you're not dead. Come on, not dead. Do you remember the 60s? Do you remember the death of God controversy? Do you remember all that stuff when theologians were coming out and saying, oh, God must be dead? Where were those guys? They are dead. But God is still alive and at work in his church, as we can see, and through the answer prayers we've been talking about this morning. Even now. There are always plenty around us, like Job's wife, who in this set of horrible experiences that can come upon you in this world would urge the afflicted man to curse God and die. But Habakkuk starts off his resort into the character of God for help, for comfort, for stability in his difficult experience by remembering that God is not dead. He is not dead, and there's more to it. He is not dead, he is the Lord. He is the Lord. Now, it, it's Yahweh, it's the divine name, it's the, the big name for God that's being used here. He's being referred to in his role as the rightful king. And you've got to get this idea because this is important to it. He is the covenant king of Judah. He is the suzerain. Israel and Judah have had their little kings, Timbok kings. They're like client kings, they're like vassal kings. And, and in, in the pattern of thought, in, in this ancient Near Eastern idea about suzerain treaties and all the rest of it, God is the, the great king in the distant land, but he's got vassal kings in, in his country. Do you see the sort of idea? You, you're happy with that? Right. He is the covenant, covenant suzerain, the great king, who has the right to rule because of the covenant. Now, to cut a long story short, the right to kingship in ancient Near Eastern political theory, why we do some interesting things here, it rested on the term cutting a covenant. And covenants were cut in stone, because that's what they had. You'd have a stele, which is a sort of pier of rock, or you'd have tablets on a wall somewhere in a temple, or something of the sort. But you'd have this covenant that was cut. It was the terms of the relationship. A people, often a subject people, with a real choice in the matter, but a people agreed to accept the sovereignty of a particular potentate. And there were provisions, and they specified the nature of the relationship on both sides. And they agreed to, I will pay taxes, and he agreed to, to rule them well and give them justice and courts and protection against their invaders. Yeah? Stuff like that. When you see a reference to the Lord in capitals, in our English translation of the Bible, you're seeing a reference to the covenant king, the great king, or the suzerain, over... Israel's of the rulers, and that God, that, that suzerain, faithfully keeps the covenant that he's cut with his people. Israel's kings, portrayed in the Old Testament as vassal kings then, of the great king Jehovah. And that great king Jehovah has appointed these incoming Babylonian hordes to execute his justice. You, Lord, you, suzerain, have appointed these to execute justice, <coughs> as spelled out in your covenant, in the provisions. The things that are happening here are all provided for in Deuteronomy. They're all provided for when Samuel gave Israel her first king. This is going to happen. If you behave like that, this is what's going to happen. Here it is happening. So it's Israel's rock, her protector, who would administer the blessings of the covenant, the provision and the protection who now administers the punishment parts of the covenant as part, part of his overarching intention, which is to bless. To bless by bringing the kingdom of God, the Messiah King, to bring Jesus. So it's God's righteous rule as Judah's legitimate ruler that Habakkuk reminds himself of in these verses. You covenant king, Yahweh, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. God's righteous rule. God is proving faithful to the covenant as he executes its penalty clauses, if you wish. You know, there's uh, Ebal and Gerizim, when they're instituting the covenant with Moses. There are the blessings on Ebal and the curses on Gerizim, isn't it? Was it the other way around? I always get it mixed up, right? So there's, there's one or the other. There's a bunch of people, a bunch of Levites and people, a bunch of the people stand on one mountain and a bunch on the other. And one recites the blessings of the covenant and one recites the penalties. God is bringing faithfully the penalties on this day. 
At the end of the day, the biggest thing we know about God, incidentally, the biggest and most crucial fact the unbelieving world around us today has forgotten is that God is set apart from sinners. God is not like us. You can't remember God, isn't it? He's other than we are. He's other. He's above us. He's the holy, and that means set apart, different from us, God. And here's what Habakkuk is saying, verse 13, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Now it's difficult to conceive of somebody like that, isn't it? Who in his absolute righteousness and justice and set apart and differentness from us cannot bear to look at sin. <clears throat> the way things have worked out in the world and the things we see, they really challenge that. When, when Go back to Adam and Eve and gardens and apples. You know, when Satan tempted Adam and Eve, he hit on a weeds that resulted in great potential for ongoing rebellion against God. Because if he could tempt them to, to, to sin, he'd bring chaos into the cosmos. God was going to have to deal with sin. God was going to have to judge sin. And chaos would come into the world. And that has given human beings their biggest reason to rebel against God ever since. We don't like the way things are in the world, and we blame God for it, and that's not where it came from. One of the most common arguments I hear people use against God is the argument from the presence of evil, pain, and suffering in the world. How can there be a God of love when? You know something? So Satan approaches Eve in the Garden of Eden with the express objective of tempting the humans to sin, trying to persuade them they could know better than God, knowing full well that's going to give them the best argument across the ages for rejecting God. Holy God would, because of his holiness, have to act on what happened in judgment, and that judgment would be misconceived by hurting humanity as evidence that God wasn't holy. It is holiness that is doing it. Neat trick, huh? And all the while these things that make it feel otherwise are happening, says Habakkuk, I know your eyes are too pure to look on evil. I know that you cannot tolerate wrong. And however I understand what I'm seeing, I'm understanding it with my little pea brain. And attributing wrong to you? No, 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 no. I know you're too pure for that. It just contrasts my perception of the things that I see. Now this isn't the end of the matter, because this fact about God is to be held in tension with the things that we see around us, which seem to be contradicted, but he's saying, you are holy, you are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. And all the while, faith tells him one thing, the stuff we've just been looking at, Habakkuk is conscious and aware that his eyes are trying to tell him another. What he sees is trying to tell him the opposite.